Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the principal's vice chancellor, Africa Intellectual Scholar Series. My name is Dr. Itumeleng Daniel Mutwahai from the Department of Biblical and Ancient Studies in the discipline of New Testament. My job here is to facilitate and to uh, lead the program. Uh, for us to start, I'd like to recognize all the leadership of the university and those that are uh, joining us virtually and on YouTube. And to do that, I'll also ask to request Professor Zotwa Moza Madikani, the Executive Director, Leadership and Transformation, to please come and do the welcome and introductory opening remark. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mutwahai. Um, I am Professor Motsama Digane, as uh, Dr. Mutwahai has introduced me. Thank you very much, um, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to this lecture, um, the lecture of uh, the Vice Chancellor uh, for Engagement by Africans and on Africa. Uh, my esteemed UNISA community and the friends of UNISA, I really want to say you're welcome. I want to say good afternoon, Sanbonani. Uh, it, it is my great pleasure, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to actually take this position uh, from the office of the vice chancellor and, um, and, and convey this message. If you will, if you can imagine an African homestead that has a wedding uh, going on. I'm actually like that girl who meets people at the gate and says, Genani, come in, please sit here while the elders are coming out to meet you. So this is like a family gathering, uh, colleagues, uh, kindly sit here uh, and, and actually wait uh, for the coming of the elders. Before the elders come, maybe let me just uh, say something that uh, in such times as this, as a university, as the University of South Africa, we truly feel the magnitude of the words that were spoken yeah, we by uh, Reverend Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King yeah. Jr. Uh, just a few hours before he was assassinated. Right. Thank you. Uh, if you will recall the sermon uh, that he titled, Sleeping Through the Revolution. It is a very powerful sermon. If you have the time, just look it up and listen to him. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, is actually warning us that it is possible that we can actually like rip Van Venkel sleep for 20 years, not knowing that there is a revolution going on. As we sit here, we have a revolution, a revolution of the mind on the continent of Africa. And as we sit here, we really want to say as a university community, as Africans, we do not want to sleep through the revolution. We actually want to be part of the revolution and we want to speak truth uh, to, the, to the life of our continent, our motherland, Africa. So the elders are coming now. I shall just step off the podium and ask the program director to usher in the next speaker. You're most welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Sit back and feast and enjoy the afternoon. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Zotra Moza, uh, for this uh, introductory and uh, opening remarks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, uh, I would like to welcome to the podium the principal and vice chancellor, who, by the way, happens to be the first woman to lead this beautiful university called the University of South Africa, Professor Puleng Lenkabula to please come and uh, do the welcome remark. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm, I'm just
Hi, Bina. Is the Vice Chancellor available now? Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Thank you. We we were struggling with joining. Okay. Thank you. I'm about to. Thank you. Yes, I'm trying to do so. Can you get me a charger? Okay. Which one is the, I'm trying to put the video on. Are you, no, it's the turn the screen. Oh, okay. Yes, I see it. I see it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, is this the one? How do I make sure? Okay. That's the part I'm trying to do so that I'm not hiding from, is it okay? Thank you. Is it okay? Is it well positioned? Hello. Hi colleagues. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, no. No, I just want my scalp. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, no. Thank you very much. Uh, should I start? Are we ready to go? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, His Excellency Professor Dr. Ambassador Tal Edgas. Uh, group Executive Chairman of GBSH Consult Group Worldwide, Goodwill Ambassador and Honorary Chancellor to the International Council for Leadership, Governance, Entrepreneurship and Management. Members of the University Council in attendance today, Cabinet Ministers in attendance, especially Honorable Togo Didiza, Minister of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development, Honorable Holomisa, Deputy Minister of Correctional Services, Department of Justice and Correctional Services and other members of the national, provincial and local government present. Advocate Mkwebani, Public Protector of the Republic of South Africa and other representatives of the Chapter 9 institutions your excellencies, ambassadors, and high commissioners representing various countries in South Africa, our program participants, executive management of the University of South Africa, Professor Meiwa, Vice Principal Research, Postgraduate Studies, Innovation and Commercialization, Professor Zodwa Mutza, Executive Director, Leadership and Transformation within the Vice Chancellor's Office. Professor Msweli, Executive Dean of Graduate School of Business Leadership. Dr. Mutuahai, UNISA Academic Department of Biblical and Ancient Studies. Members of business community present here today representatives of uh, fellow institutions of higher 
education in attendance today, members of the university community, organized labor, civil society, student leadership, students, academics, alumni, friends of the University of South Africa, representatives from various media houses in attendance, distinguished members of the audience, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I must uh, thank uh, the University of South Africa staff, especially the DLT, for organizing Africa's intellectual engagements this afternoon. This is particularly important because universities in Africa, as the Leza states, must not just be located within the university, but their reason and existential reality, as well as articulation of knowledge must at all times be entwined with the emancipatory aspirations but praxis towards the transformative agenda of such countries. The concept of people gathering and meeting to take decisions, examine challenges, celebrate victories, plan for community and national activities are as old as human societies in Africa, including their reflexivity within institutions of learning. In our own domain as the university, we practice this culture very actively as we engage and deliberate on a varied uh, issues in our context, but also in the global arena. We create spaces, share ideas, and ensure that we inform one another on how we handle the great resources of our countries, our continent, and Africa's knowledge systems, civilizations, epistemological frameworks, as well as how people in the continent negotiate living and living with dignity. As I welcome you and open the discussion this afternoon, I wish to, I wish to briefly reflect on one or two issues. First, that in the recent article of Africa's preeminent scholar, Isa Shivji, he makes the point that throughout the history of humankind, masses have been moved by the grand narrative of liberty, freedom, justice, and, em and emancipation to bring about change, sometimes revolutionary, at other times not so much. Humanity stands at a crossroads. It is crying out for fundamental change. We need an alternative utopia to live and fight for if we are not to be consumed by death and the destruction wrought by the barbaric systems of the last five centuries. The worst of that barbarism has been felt and continues to be endured in the continent and context of Africa. Shivji traces the evolution of conquest and exploitation of continent over the periods. He then analyzes the emergence of Pan-Africanism, its strength and limitations as it attempts to free the continent first from colonialism and now from neocolonialism. Despite its limitation, Shivji argues that Pan-Africanism remains a potent force for continuing, for continuing to struggle uh, for continuing struggle for the total emancipation of Africa and her peoples. While some may be critical of the employment of the concept of grand narratives as a necessity uh, or as a necessary approach to continuing and confronting existential problems, he argues for a reconstruction of a new Pan-Africanist grand narrative to face the unfinished tasks of national liberation and to move forward to the task of social emancipation. What for me, I feel and hear him appealing to the consciousness of society, especially those in higher education, is for the reimagination of counter narratives against the dominant ontological and epistemic conceptualizations of challenges facing our continent. He specifically once again surrendering 
to the agnosticism or eclecticism that the world is not knowable and explainable, however, approximately. Whilst it may be important to use it, conceptualization in humanities, it is also important to ensuring that this idea of the world that is not knowable, that is not explainable, that is approximate, must also be accessible to those not within university system. What we know and explain should, however, be produced by ourselves in ways that are beneficial, not only for political and socioeconomic liberation, but equally for the advancement of epistemic freedom and ecological flourishing against hegemonic knowledge systems that are based on especially Eurocentricism or Western civilization. Our task therefore is to articulate a different Africa from what is known or what is projected as Africa. The calls such as these from Shivji, uh, Mamdani, um, as well as other scholars such, such as Zen Tadese are quite important for the struggles for epistemic freedom take place against the backdrop of strife in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, the attacks in Chad by Boko Haram, the instability in Mali, the de-establishization of some regions of Mozambique, wars, instability, and the general sense or lack of peace, which are some of the major challenges that we are facing in the continent. In the context of South Africa, the president has highlighted the next pandemic, the second pandemic he refers, which is the gender-based violence, which is evident in this context, but also in the continent and the global arena, which requires strengthened feminist, womanist, uh, muherista, and other ideas around creating environments where women and men and those who are gender non-conforming still find dignity. And these are quite important for us in South Africa, in the continent, but also in rethinking and reweaving ideas around dignity, freedom, liberty, and emancipation as stated earlier on. The Western Cape based Trade Law Center has listed a range of challenges facing the continent. These can be grouped uh, in a number of clusters, but they may not necessarily be composite of the broad challenges. Some of these refer to issues of broad sustainability, including food sovereignty, food security, inadequate public health care systems and provision or poor natural resources management and the lack of rural development. We have already evidenced and experienced and continue to experience the challenges in the health system which have been laid bare by COVID-19. Security is one other area, whether human security, ecological security and flourishing that include crime, violence, wars, terrorism, threats, but also neoliberal ideologies that focus on consumption and not necessarily on the building of societies for their flourishing. Under development uh, infrastructures that include poor water and sanitation, insecure energy supply, poor transportation systems, and the lag in the ICT systems, in spite of the fact that we are told this is the context of the fourth industrial revolution where knowledge is interface and the knowledge economy is quite important. Developing governance systems, including in public sector governance, legal and justice systems, where the idea of justice has become warped and the sensitivities around the dignity of those on the margins no longer become evident. The questions of social inequality 
including gender inequality and differentiated, differentiated race and religious opportunistic separation. Some of these which are not necessarily in the continent, but which we see in the multilateral context where in violence and di dissonances between communities are evidence. The, the above challenges should be, view should be viewed against the resolve of African Union to transforming the continent into a prosperous uh, 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 continent where there is development and stability. The 2014 Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, outlined seven key aspirations that the continent should have accomplished by the time it celebrates the centennial of the establishment of the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, in 2063. These are a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development, an integrated continent politically united and based on the ideals of Pan-Africanism, the vision of Africa's renaissance, an Africa of good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice, and the rule of law. A peaceful and secure Africa. An Africa with strong cultural identity, common heritage, values, and ethics. An Africa where development is people-driven, unleashing the potential of its women and youth, who in the patriarchal, curiacal context are often marginalized or their value to the socio-economic and political positionality is undermined. Africa, a strong, united, influential global player and partner is what it is requested. These aspirations should inform the development trajectory of every organization on the continent, both public and private, as a university, our stated vision is to being the African university shaping futures in the service of humanity. Thus, the University of South Africa, which wishes to play a central role in contributing to the agenda of the African continent that we must realize now because 2063 is too far. As a higher education institution, the relevant key aspiration is that one that is people focused, that is people driven development that unleashes the potential of women, youth and communities within the country and the continent. Africa has the youngest population in the world. The youthful component and dividend keeps on expanding and has led to some referring to this phenomenon as a youth bulge. It was estimated in 2015 that there were 200 million young people between 15 and 24 on the continent, with that number projected to double in 2045. These young people must be absorbed by higher education sector, which we must also acknowledge has some limitations. Besides physical capacity, our sector has challenges that include type of knowledge that we transmit, Hence, the 2015 fees must fall movement, which may still erupt if we do not implement uh, some of the brilliant ideas that we have formulated on knowing transformation that drove and were asserted by them would get lost. And we would need to ensure that we work, we work towards their institutionalization. Key to this are the calls for Africa's languages as languages of science, development, innovation, and communication, as languages that are at the center of the pedagogies and curriculum development within our university, for instance. But it is also around occasioning institutional cultures of learning where dignity is at the center where relationality and inventive approaches become important. In his study of higher education sector, Tafara makes sobering assertion on the state of internationalization of higher education in Africa 
which touches on the issues of content that we teach, the research that we produce, and the languages we use in transmitting knowledge. Tafera observes the paradoxical condition of higher education on the continent being the most internationalized, not by participation, but by omission, relying heavily on discourses, paradigms, parameters set by others, rendering it vulnerable to global, in particular, Euro-American whims and idiosyncrasies. Thus, Africa's higher education assumes an a position of a consumer system by being the least uh, internationally engaged. In simple terms, Africa's higher education is the most dominated and at least assertive of all provinces of knowledge. The challenge that we must address as higher education sector is not the narrow and market-oriented concerns for the production of schools a skilled workforce as defined by the human capital theory. Of course, our institution must be responsive to national continental imperatives and produce the types of graduates who will help transcend Africa's current state of uh, challenges. Our concerns should, however, go beyond the, these narrow concerns. We must develop the types of curriculum and produce the kind of research that frees the continent from the parameters set by others and as such determine our own knowledge systems, parameters, anchor points, as well as critical criteria for what constitutes liberating and relevant knowledge systems. In asking the question, Africa, where do we stand? And trying to define the new frontiers we should perhaps follow some of the logic, not necessarily linear, but which uh, draw on the dynamics of our own philosophies and knowledge system. First, we must go back to the history and histories of conquest and revisit the ideals that the forebears formulated as they waged the liberation struggles and developed philosophies of Pan-Africanism and of Ubuntu and other philosophies that have been the rallying point. Second, we must identify the challenges and opportunities that we face as the continent and confront the root causes of such challenges. Key to this being the pandemic, wherein the continent is left behind grappling with the ravaging uh, 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 pandemic, which is uh, decimating communities institutions, but also ideas of death and dying with dignity. Third, we must affirm the aspirations of for a developed Africa in line with Agenda 2063 and other aspirations not necessarily beholden by the market imperatives, but by heterodox approaches that understand the imperatives for living well, for flourishing societies, for sustainability, and for dignity and democratization. We must, the, we must as well strengthen higher education systems by making it relevant and responsive to the fears, aspirations, but also the longing of Africa's peoples living with dignity. Professor Tal Edgars, we therefore as a community, an epistemic community of UNISA, but also located and with a footprint in the country, in the continent, and globally. The University of South Africa, we are honored to hosting you this afternoon, and it is a great privilege to sit as part of your audience as we look forward to listening to your lecture, and we wish you and all of us great deliberations as we learn together and learning with you from your research and analytics. Thank you very much. You're welcome, colleagues, and you're welcome, Professor Edgar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, um, Professor Linkabula, um, Principal and Vice-Chancellor. 
of the University of South Africa. Uh, you have raised key most important things that uh, need further discussion. And I suppose as a university, we will have to endeavor to have uh, further conversations regarding the matters in which you have highlighted that forms in a way uh, the underpinning conversation that we are to, to have today. And more so the intersectionality of all of these matters and how we are to find epistemic solutions to these issues. And to that, I would uh, ask a professor, Tenjiwe Meiwa, Vice Principal, Research, Postgraduate, and Innovate, Innovation and Commercialization at the University of South Africa, to please um, give us the purpose of the lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Program Director Dr. Mutuahaya for ushering me in. I want to also thank and extend gratitude to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Puling Linkabula, for the welcome that has set the scene. If anything, much of what I'm actually tasked to work on this afternoon in terms of the purpose of this lecture, she's done that. What a week we've had, a week really of many things in South Africa since the presidential announcement this past Sunday. With enhanced lockdown restrictions due to COVID, a lot has happened and one can only assume that more news and incidents are on the way. As the higher education sector and the University of South Africa in particular, we've had to jump through several loops and try to catch balls. The calf balls just thrown at us due to the ripple effects of the global pandemic. Despite all these disruptions, in actual fact, precisely because of these disruptions, there has never been a better time to have these kinds of conversations that we're having right now and the one that we're having this afternoon that the Vice Chancellor has made reference to. My name is Tenji Wemeiwa. I'm the Vice Principal responsible for research and of course the intellectual engagement, hence the purpose that I'm trying to get you and I and us within Africa, on the, on the South African soil and beyond the seas, as I also try to get you to come over as we come around this table and talk with each other and reflect on what the ambassador is going to share with us. The purpose of this lecture, but before I get to that, this is the intellectual scholar series lecture and this one is held under the topic, the new frontier, Africa, where do we stand? Wow, what a question. But before I get to the purpose, which somehow is intertwined with what I'm saying right now, we are very grateful and humbled that as we host this lecture this afternoon, it is amongst other reasons a way of living out His Excellency Dr. Tabombegi's celebrated legacy of being and doing good at all cost. And his outstanding belief is captured in what is I open the calls, he says, I think you are a much more happier person if you say, even if I get involved in politics, I'm only doing so in order to serve the people. You will sleep much easier, not serving yourself, but having done 
your best to serve other people. Even if you have not succeeded, at least you've tried. You haven't stolen anything and you haven't robbed the people. Are close quotes. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, patrons, distinguished guests across the continent of Africa and within the land of South Africa and beyond. These are kind of matters that we have to grapple with in terms of why are we about? And for us, lectures of this kind and the theme of African scholars is about, amongst other things, what Our Excellency, Dr. Tabombegi, our Chancellor, makes reference to. How could we save? How could we have a different Africa? And it starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with you. It starts with me. So these lectures are meant to be getting us to reverse back a bit and ask ourselves these questions to ensure that in what we do, we become as the investor of South Africa, what we were set up to be, to reach out to Africa, to be a gateway so that knowledge creation is possible, but not just for the sake of creating knowledge, but that we do so with the intention to serve, with the intention that you serve better, I serve better, so that Africa becomes a better place that we are all at, as propounded by the Africa that we want to see through the, 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 the African Union's 2063 imperative. So that's that's on a broad level the purpose of these lectures. How, how do we come to be the best that we can? By being cognizant of the need to serve, but also by checking on what knowledge parameters do we live in, do we create, do we challenge, do we interact with to ensure that what we seek to do in our serving, we serve with an intention of ensuring that indeed we become the best that we possibly can be, a better Africa, a better continent, and by ripple effect, a better world. So for us, given the events that have happened on this week, that I'm not gonna take you through all of them because I will assume that you all read news, it's imperative that we talk. The value of talking is actually what we do in Africa best because we're still largely oral. And that's one of the reasons that we're doing this kind of lecture series through the office of the vice chancellor, Professor Puleng Lingabula. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, as we value talking to each other, as we sit around the table, as we reflect and think of what and the ambassador is about to share with us, let us come along and listen carefully and possibly engage better and improve our South Africa, improve our Africa, and by default improve the globe because of the contribution that we have. That's the engagement, that the purpose of these series of lectures, uh, of the series of lectures that we have is meant to be, to get us to talk, talk better, improve each other, improve ourselves and all that that we do. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Meiwa, Vice Principal, Research, Postgraduate, Innovation and Commercialization. Ladies and gentlemen, we arrived at that time, at that point in time where uh, we are to announce and introduce to you our guest speaker, His Excellency. I will ask Professor Zotwa Moza, 
Executive Director, Leadership and Transformation in the Office of the Vice Chancellor, to please introduce to us the speaker, His Excellency Edgar. Thank you. Thank you, Program Director. Thank you very much. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, you have heard us speak and say a lot. Thank you, Madam Vice Chancellor, uh, for laying the ground and uh, showing us uh, the key levers of uh, what we need to talk about, what we engage on every day. And thank you very much, uh, Madam DVC, Prof Meiwa, for what you have uh, just articulated. Um, may I just say up front, ladies and gentlemen, that um, the keynote speaker's bio is a star-studded galaxy. You don't know where to touch, what to touch in order to properly introduce him. So he will uh, dearly pardon me if I have butchered um, his eminent uh, biography when I'm introducing him. But I know, colleagues, that we are not here uh, to hear about what he is. We are here to hear what he has to say. He is a very, very um, impactful son of the soil of Africa, who does not only confine himself to Africa in his impact, but has touched the globe at wide, uh, Europe, America, and Asia, as one person who is very excellent in planning, managing, and executing project. Um, he is, uh, in his fear of uh, 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 mentorship, he has grown the continent, particularly being mindful of women uh, amongst many projects. I'm just talking about uh, the project that he, he dealt with uh, in the program under the former Secretary uh, of State, uh, Hillary Clinton in the United States. He also advises heads of state. Uh, but beyond that, uh, His Excellency is an academic. He didn't uh, put this in his bio, but I'm yet to see one academic who will say, I'm now pursuing my fourth PhD. Um, I, am, uh, I am sorry, ladies and gentlemen, my picture is blurred, but uh, I think the whole point is to actually just introduce His Excellency. I will try and cut short. You can read his uh, bio on your own because of the challenges of uh, transmission this side. But uh, Professor uh, Dal Edgars, we are very honored to have you amongst us. Uh, and I'm yet to see someone who will equal you in amassing so many uh, awards, even during the course of the pandemic, you are still amassing awards. We are really honored, uh, son of the soil. Please just uh, step forward, uh, Your Excellency. The children of Africa are waiting for you. We have been long waiting to hear what you have to share with us. Uh, Your Excellency, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Zodwa. Um, I would gladly, and for that endearing salutation, not only but introduction, which I normally say, my father would have been would have found hard to believe, but my mother would have been proud of. Um, thank you very much, Professor Puleng, for having me. Distinguished members of the faculty, students, friends, I hope that covers everybody. It is very good to be with you in this magnificent Vice Chancellor's Africa Intellectual Scholar Series. It really is a wonderful setting to be able to speak about issues that go back as old as the institution, I fear. I know it is in many ways a tradition for a speaker to offer pens of tribute to the institute they're speaking in. But I do want to acknowledge the extraordinary connection of this university in Africa. Throughout the years, UNISA was perhaps the only university in South Africa to have provided all people with access to education irrespective of race, color, or creed. My topic today on Africa, the next frontier, where do we stand, begins with a story of a Senegalese who in the morning wakes up, turns off his alum made in China, comes out of his woven sheets made in India, puts on his clothes made in Bangladesh, drinks his Spanish orange juice, puts French milk in his coffee produced in Brazil, all bought from Oten, a French MNC. He jumps into his Japanese-made car to get to the Total gas station. 
He refuels and takes his Korean smart Samsung phone made in Taiwan and pays with orange money. At noon, he leaves his office in a Moroccan bank and joins his friend who smokes American cigarettes. They eat a tip made with Cambodian rice and without spending a dime that will stay in the country, they debate as to why there's no work or money in Senegal. This sounds oddly familiar to many of us who have not paid attention to the made in Africa narrative. Read between the lines, an uphill battle, low hanging fruit. Few things muddy the mind quite so effectively as a cliche in its jaunty assuredness and painful banality, the cliché is like the most onerous of dinner guests, sure of its welcome, yet tedious in the extreme. These soulless words disrupt our speech, invade our thoughts and impede our understanding. It was political theorist Hannah Arendt that best encapsulated that final point. Clichés, stock phrases, adherence to conventional standardized codes of expression and conduct have socially recognized function of protecting us against reality. That is against the claim on our thinking attention that all events and facts made by virtue of their existence. In How to Write About Africa, Binyavanga satirizes the point and the brainless writing it creates. In your text, treat Africa as if it were one country. It is hot and dusty with rolling grasslands and huge herds of animals and tall thin people who are starving. Or, is, or it is hot and steamy with very short people who eat primates. Unlike any other landmass, Africa seems to reduce writers and researchers to semi-poetic semi nonsense, vague allusions and cliches, though most exaggerated in travelogues and breathy film scripts, mainstream business writing on the continent, from beyond the continent, often does the same in a minor key. Analysis is, is freighted with presumptions. Africa has a uniformity, the ubiquity of corruption, the totality of government incompetence, that block comprehension. Some of these things are true, of course, but in the trite one not delivery cliched in thought, if not word, they remove the African adult reader from the reality on the ground. If there's one thing I hope to achieve in this lecture, it is to offer a view of Africa beyond those usual cliches. I will fail at several points. It is impossible to analyze such a massive topic in such a finite space without doing so. But by assembling a deep collective consciousness from distinct geographies and backgrounds, I hope I can bring more nuance to the discussion. Africa has shaped my mind, anchored my identity, influenced my beliefs and made me who I am. Africa matters to me. Africa is not underdeveloped as many would think, but rather in the context of history and cultural heritage, it is highly developed in a state of decay. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that we must take a historical journey if only to appreciate the factors that animated Africa to seek to regain self-independence or self-determination in many countries. In the same breath, I will hopefully wish to indulge your intellectual depth around stepping away from mythifying the hashtag Africa rising and establish an intellectual foundation and in all honesty, political discourse so as not to remain in the domain of supposition as to the ideology of hippie countries in Africa which means the highly indebted poor countries. After an introduction arguing against analyzing Africa as a uniformity, it is rather unfortunate that I, it makes no sense to begin by doing precisely that. Though far from the most nuanced view, we must work our way down and start at a high altitude. Professor Pulang mentioned just previously about Pan-Africanism and maybe I need to start from there. A history in Pan-Africanism. To have this Pan-African thought and conversation with substantive contribution to contemporary transformation in itself is a labor of love. I hold the objective view that we must contribute to transforming the fossilized Euro Eurocentric curricula, which has insisted that for centuries poverty continues to occupy the central position in African epistemologies on almost every subject under the sun. My take this time to acknowledge the patience perseverance and passion of all the committed scholars who continuously contribute to the new African narrative. Seek ye first the political kingdom and all other things will be added unto it. The famous biblical injunction of Kwame Nkrumah, founding Ghanaian president and Pan-African prophet of the 1950s, continues to reverberate across Africa and the diaspora several decades after it was added. 
Having achieved political kingdom by 1994 with the liberation of South Africa, African diaspora found, however, that all other things were not added unto it. Africans and their descendants are still on a painful quest for three magic kingdoms, peace and democratic governance, socioeconomic transformation, and cultural equality. Pan-Africanism moved from Manchester back to Africa and became mostly an ideology of governments and no longer one of civil society. A historical battle was waged for its soul between a radical Casablanca minority bloc led by Kwame Nkrumah and also including Guinea, Mali, Egypt, Algeria, and Morocco, and the majority of more conservative African states grouped in the Brazzaville and Monrovia blocs, whose leaders favored a more gradualist approach to continental unity. Nkrumah called for a United States of Africa, by Africans, for Africans, in which countries would pool their sovereignty in the areas of economics, security, and foreign policy, as a way of achieving industrialization. The Ghanaian leader envisaged a continental authority to oversee integrated planning and transport systems and advocated the building of a vast road and railway network, a great increase in air links and a massive upgrade of continental ports. Nkrumah regarded the association agreement between Francophone African countries and French-led European common market as collective colonialism designed to make Africa a permanent supplier of primary products for European markets. He called and insisted for the establishment of an African common market with a common currency and a common policy for intra-African and extra-continental trade. An alternative vision to Krumah was provided by Tanzanian socialist leader, Julius Mwalimu Nyerere. He offered the most cogent intellectual opposition to Krumah in calling for a more gradualist approach to regional integration involving the use of sub-regional bodies, such as East Africa's British-inherited federal institutions, such as building blocks, before federating with a larger continental group. As Nyerere noted, African unity is at present merely an emotion born of a historical of colonialism and oppression. It has to be strengthened and expressed in economic and political forms before it can really have a positive effect on the future. Though like Nkrumah, Nyerere also advocated a federal United States of Africa. A final goal he kept treading, the need to convince newly sovereign countries through patient persuasion to take the necessary steps for integration willingly. A third vision of Pan-African cooperation was provided by Francophone leaders like Senegalese poet, President Leopold Senghor. He advocated cooperation on an economic, financial, cultural, technical and scientific issues while pursuing minimalist political cooperation in which African states harmonize their foreign policies, insisting that Africa must not be placed out of a global historical context. Sengo argued that colonialism had its dark moments and its moments of light. If it destroyed some of the values of civilization, Europe sometimes brought its substitutes. I wonder how many they brought and how many they left with. But almost always fatal ones, he always said, complementary ones, if you will. Unlike Nkrumah, Senghor was proposed to see positive aspects in colonialism and to attempt a synthesis between Africa and Europe. For the Ghanaian leader, however, colonialism was the very antithesis of everything that African liberation stood for. Senghor suggested that Europe might have destroyed African values, but for him, it also brought technical skills to Africa where Nkrumah urged Africa to harness its own resources for development, Senghor promoted a prag pragmatic use of European, in this case, French financial resources. All this said led to Nkrumah's vision of a union government of African state, which would have involved a common currency and monetary zone, an African military command, and a common foreign policy. In May 1963, 32 African states met in the ancient Ethiopia's capital of Addis Ababa, to sign the OAU Charter, which clearly reflected the triumph of Nyerere. But despite its shortcomings, the OAU deserves some credit for its firm and consistent commitment to decolonization and the anti-apartheid struggles in South Africa, to which the African diaspora in the US, the Caribbean and the Europe contributed massively. But then we argue, how did Africa then become underdeveloped? 
The search for new markets and amidst a global Great Depression in the early 1880s was a widespread concern that spurred on imperialism. In Africa, modern scientific methods were introduced into colonial territories that led to the production of minerals and cash crops. African economies became structured as the economies in the Caribbean and the Americas that have been for two decades and centuries to produce crops to meet Western consumer needs. This both increased the dependence of African economies on metropoli metropolitan economies, and in many cases, negatively impacted on the ability of African populations to produce their own food. Africans imbibed Western consumption patterns without acquiring Western production methods. The fact that self-rule and university education were mostly introduced to African territories after the Second World War was a clear sign of the lack of priority given to such critical sectors. Most independent African countries, therefore, had very few trained personnel to run the administrative systems inherited from colonial rule. Though the percentage of Africans living in absolute poverty fell 58 to 41 percent between 2000 and 2016, and primary school enrollment had increased from 60 to 80 percent, most of the poorest economic performers in the UN's Human Development Index remained African countries. The flattering Western narrative of rising Africa had thus again been dramatically halted by the collapse of the commodity boom which resulted in a 16% fall in Sub-Saharan Africa's terms of trade by 2016. By 2020, about a third of Africa's countries were heavily indebted. In, he in his famous treatise, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, 1972, the prophetic Guyanese scholar activist Walter Rodney, who also taught in Tanzania at the time of Julius Nyerere, traced the roots of underdevelopment to the 1884 to the 1885 conference in Berlin, he lamented the consumerist rather than the productive nature of African economies and the general lack of savings across the continent. Kwame Nkrumah, the first African nationalist to become president of an independent Ghana, hung a picture of Edwin Blyden in his office. In his way, Nkrumah demonstrated who had inspired him and taught him the basic tenets of modern African nationalism. Blyden was the intellectual forefather and teacher of black and African nationalists as diverse as Dubois, and Gavi, Kesley, Hayford, and George Padmore, as Ikiwe and Kenyatta, and finally Cesare and Sengo. This quote from Israeli scholar Benjamin Neuberger shows that in the 21st century, Edward Blyden remains one of the powerhouses of Pan-Africanism due to his unique and historical contributions to ideas around African unity, identity, dignity, sovereignty, and prosperity. Blyden had a profound influence on the makers of modern Pan-Africanism. Current generations unfamiliar with his ideas, therefore need to revisit his perceptive reflections on African identity, self-determination, Africa's umbilical links with the diaspora and the meaning of territorial nationalism in colonial West Africa. Also worth noting, Blyden's work spreads directly to contemporary debates about the decolonizing of education the centrality of indigenous knowledge production to African liberation and the obstacles to realizing these objectives. Revisiting Blyden's work is essential in recreating the indivisible links between black nationalism and Pan-Africanism. Before Pan-Africanism, there was African nationalism, but nationalism was inconceivable without a sophisticated conception of racial pride, patriotism and consciousness that Blyden helped to articulate through his writings. In this regard, Blyden's erudite defense of black identity and self-respect forged the parameters of Pan-Africanism, both as a universal idea uniting African people and the organizational impetus for continental emancipation and integration. The, the truth is that for all of the world's discussion of Africa's vastness, its scale is often underplayed. This is not a continent equivalent in size to Europe or the United States. It's larger than both of those combined, with enough room remaining to accommodate China and India. It is a territory entirely mind-boggling in its expanse. So far, so cliched. But to add some prosaic shade and subtlety to our portrait, this massiveness, external endlessness, the continent is almost nearly infinite. It is home to more than 1.2 billion people, not far shy for, from China's populace. 
that speaks upwards of 2,000 languages. By comparison, Europe houses a little over 200 agots and dialects. That linguistic multiplicity is coupled with an ethnic one. Across its 54 nations, fully 3,000 different indigenous groups live, including the Berbers and Zulus, Yorubas and Igbos, Fulanis and Ashanti, and of course, many, many, many more. These cultures carry traditions that far predate Portuguese, French, Dutch, German, and British colonial occupations. While those native traditions speak to Africa's past, those that build and invest in companies on the continent spend most of their time thinking about the future. Many may have become convinced of the African opportunity by observing the demographic Zephyrs powering the continent into the coming decades. No other region on earth is poised to undergo such explosive growth across so many dimensions. Though many may know the contours of those trends, it's worth alighting on them further to emphasize their importance. An introduction to what the big Africa looks like. Allow me to implore you to reset your mental map about Africa. Africa will soon be the fastest urbanizing region in the world, and it will have as many cities with more than 1 million inhabitants as North America does, and more than 80% of its population growth over the next two decades will occur in cities. The income per capita of Africa's cities is more than double the continental average. If Africa's population is expected to double, reaching 2.4 million, the effects of this increase on a professional basis is particularly interesting. Today, Africans make up 16% of the global population. By 2050, they will comprise 25%. That hints at the potential for serious earthly influence. As is perhaps to be expected, this growth is likely to appear throughout my lecture. When looking at growth and opportunity, the same handful of markets often receive mention with regards to population. Half of the expected 2.4 billion will live in five countries, Nigeria at 411 million, Ethiopia at 191 million, Egypt at 153 million, the Democratic Republic of Congo at 197 million, and Tanzania and 138 million. Of those, Nigeria and Egypt already represent budding and flourishing tech economies. Africa has a median age of around 20. The number of smartphone connections was forecast to double from 315 million in 2015 to 636 million in 2022, twice the projected number in North America and not far from the total in Europe. It feels almost a little silly to point this out and to spend the most time referencing the income swell of African youth, given the measures shared above, but it's a point worth noting for its impact on the world of work. Yes, Africa's growth will mean it's a young continent. It also means it will supply a disproportionate percentage of the world's working age people, with roughly half of the 2.4 billion expected to be younger than 25 years old. Indeed, over a 50 year time scale, there will be likely be more people in that cohort than in every other G20 country combined. At a time when many advanced economies are seeing population growth stagnate, this is profound. Organizations in need of employees will find the largest pool available in Africa. As we'll discuss later, one of tech's greatest opportunities is in ensuring that young Africans have the skills and training necessary to meet the labor demands of the future. As is to be expected, these new generations will predominantly cluster in cities, creating economic powerhouses with relatively small footprints, but considerably spending power. A frankly staggering 80% of population growth will accrue to urban centers, creating the world's largest metropolitan areas. By 2050, 10 of the biggest 50 cities will be Africa. In just the next 10 years, a collection of Africa's biggest 18 cities will reach, will reach $1.3 trillion in spending. That's the kind of commercial scale that can support and galvanize new ventures. With as many African cities with more than 1 million inhabitants as North America already, the truth is that the shift is already well underway. As Africa grows and urbanizes, spending power is expected to increase. In particular, the continent will see a rising middle class expected to reach 580 million by 2030 with an upper class of an additional 116 million. For context, that's more than double the current US population. 
Though such figures suggest a tidal wave of prosperity, some gradation and distinction is required. Yes, the size of Africa's middle and upper classes will be enormous, but its spending power isn't equivalent. That's because what constitutes the middle class in one country is not the same as in another. Though, reasonably, though re through reasonable studies may set benchmarks differently, it's inarguable that the average middle class citizen in America makes considerably more than an African counterpart. A Pew Research study set median U.S. household income at $74,000 or roughly $200 per day. A Brookings report on Africa's middle class study set the lower boundary at just $2 per day. The same report argued that to be part of the upper class, African residents would need to bring in more than $20 per day. Orders of magnitude separate the delineation in one country to those on the continent. This isn't to say the absolute numbers are not impressive or worthy of note. By 2025, African consumer spending is slated to reach 2.1 trillion US dollars, rising to 2.5 trillion US dollars by 2030. While US consumer spending tops 12 trillion US dollars, India comes in closer to $1 trillion. Clearly, the latter country has been able to develop an extraordinary, prosperous tech scene, even if there remains plenty of room left to run. In time, Africa's ecosystem may look similarly rich, with a burgeoning middle class particularly to thank. Africa is often seen as synonymous with poverty, yet the share of Africans who are poor fell from 56% in 1990 to 43% in 2012, according to the World Bank. Adult literacy rates have climbed by 10 percent points since 1990 to 63%, still low but rapidly improving. There's a demographic boom combined with GDP growth rates of 6, 7, or 8 percent. Africa is in the midst of a significant acceleration. Real GDP grew at an average annual rate of little over 2 percent during the 1980s and 1990s, but then leaped right ahead to 5.4 percent in 2000 to 2010, making Africa the world's second fastest growing region after emerging Asia. A few numbers to, to note, $5.6 trillion in projected consumer and business spending by 2025, 1.2 billion people with population exceeded to double by 2050, 11 million square miles of land, three times that of Europe, 400 companies with annual revenue of 1 billion US dollars or more, 122 million active users of mobile financial services, 89 cities of over 1 million inhabitants by 2030, 54 countries expected to create the world's largest free trade area, two times potential growth in manufacturing output by 2025. Africa will account for one-fifth of the humanity by 2025. Private consumption in Africa rose from 860 billion US dollars in 2008 to 1.4 trillion US dollars in 2015, significantly higher than that of India, which has a similar population size. What am I saying in all this? What is the true picture? More than 50 million African households, around 30% of the total already have income above 5,000 US dollars a year. This might sound low by Western standards. Statistics indicate the number to exceed 70 million households by 2025. The number of global consumer households, those earning $20,000 or more, is also growing and is likely to top $10 million US dollars by 2025. If you were to use the PPP, the purchasing power parity to African consumer numbers, more than 70% of African households will have discretionary income, and more than a quarter will be global consumers. Africa has an opportunity to double its manufacturing out output to nearly $1 trillion US dollars by 2025. For all the discussions of developing countries leapfrog leapfrogging the developed, Africa still lags when it comes to internet connectivity and mobile phone penetration. Obviously, those represent rather critical ingredients in the construction of a thriving tech market. As things stand, just 22% of Africans have internet access, far below the 80% of Europeans, 68% of Russians and Central Asians, and 44% of those in the Asia-Pacific region. Though better, the proportion of the population that uses a mobile phone is also low. In sub-Saharan Africa, for example, 45% have a device, or 477 million people, if you will. There are large, absolute numbers, but of course, there's still considerable room to run. As with so much in the world of African innovation, what often seems to be a deficiency can quickly be reframed as an opportunity.
Certainly connectivity comparatively low, but it's grown at a remarkable clip. In 2005, just 2% of Africans could access the internet. 2% by that point in the US, 68% already had their modems fired up and were patiently waiting 30 minutes to download a chip. Companies act like migrating geese, flying from country to country as costs and demand change. According to this analogy, factors, factories from a leading country are forced by labor price pressure to invest in a follower country, helping it accumulate ownership and move up the technology curve. This movement shifts the bulk of economic activity in the follower country from low productivity agriculture and informal services to high productivity manufacturing. The follower country eventually becomes a leading country, spawning companies in search of new production locations. The paradigm offers a convincing model of how Asian economies developed a chain from Japan to the Asian tigers in China. With the right policies and long-term vision, Africa could become the next global manufacturing hub. As a share of GDP, infrastructure investment in Africa has remained at around 3.5% since 2000. This will need to rise to 4.5% if Africa is to close its infrastructure gap. In absolute terms, this means doubling annual investment in infrastructure to 150 billion US dollars by 2025. Based on benchmarking levels of spending, Africa's annual investment in power infrastructure will need to rise from $33 billion to around $55 billion in 2025. In 1975, only 25% of Africans lived in cities. By 2015, that share had risen to 40%, and by 2037, Africa will have shifted to a majority of urban populations. I would love to explore the dimensions of the risk and how the public sector will influence the ecosystem. In particular, I would have loved to highlight three regulatory practices that impede the idea of entrepreneurship or small-scale growth, banning then learning, moving slowly and succumbing to tradition. But in the interests of time, I would love to respond to this particularly within the questions and leave with one specific area that would be able to be of concern. Africa in itself has got too much to offer. It has been a constant movement since the 1990s, 1980s to speak of Africa rising, Africa on the growth curve, ETC, ETC, but when shall we act? We speak of privatization. Russia and Europe have finished and they did that well over 30 years ago. We take a lot of time to do things. I hold the objective view that we do have the capacity, we have the people and we do have the capital. I am not persuaded that Africa does not have the capital to develop. If we have the political will, we can do that as of tomorrow and bring down all the barriers to movement of people in Africa. It does not require an act of parliament. It is purely an administrative process. We can make African currencies fully convertible. It does not require an act of parliament. It is purely an administrative process. We can try to work together to pool our resources. It does not require an act of parliament. It requires evolution to want to do that. The answer lies within all African governments. The ideas to have fought for self-determination and independence was not to do so even against our very own African neighbor states. Samuel Goldwyn had a pleasantly slapdash way with words. The founder of Paramount and Goldwyn Pictures was said to have come up with such amusing malapropisms as, I don't think anybody should write his autobiography until after he's dead, and include him out. One of those Goldwynisms showed an astuteness, a passivity that would have diff been difficult to capture in a more linear, logical phrasing. We need new cliches. The same could be said of Africa with massive demographic tailwinds, a growing capital base, a cohort of companies building necessary infrastructure, the next century may very well belong to our continent. We can hope that as its position on the global stage grows, more granular detail, more profound analysis, 
and greater attention is given to the industries and companies it hosts. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing me to contribute to my African duty, and may God bless Africa, Nkosi Sigeleli Africa. Thank you. Wow, wow. Um, it is what we can say. Indeed, the son of the soil has spoken. Indeed, it, the son of the soil has raised very dependent matters that we as children have okay am i better now yes um uh, apologies for that um Thank you, thank you very, very much, um, Ambassador, Academic, Professor Edgar. The son of the soil has spoken, and the son of the soil has raised important, critical elements that we've got to engage on. And for that, we appreciate raising the consciousness about the imperatives that Africa has got to, to seriously reflect on and to stop procrastinating, but to start working and digging the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to, if there are questions that uh, they would like people want to raise, the audience would like to raise, uh, you are welcome to do so by uh, dropping the questions on the chat, on the YouTube uh, chat box. Um, but to start the conversation, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Edgar to kindly reflect a little bit on the lessons that we can learn from a leader such as Thomas Sankara, who taking over the leadership uh, made it a determinate that he needed to transform Burkina Faso and uh, bring in the important uh, literacy among his people. So if you could perhaps maybe, uh, if you could just say, what are the things that we can learn from leaders such as him? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Etumelang, for the question and for those who have had the audacity or the privilege to actually write, to read about the works of Thomas Sankara. You will realize that it is not so far off from the Pan-Africanism of the Black Nationalism movement. But it, in itself, it raises a contemporary debate that then how do we get to a point to decolonize education? It is the most, it is the most simplest form of our transformative change. And, and, and then again, the two words Dr. Itumelang had paid attention to was what is transformation and what is change? How do we then gain knowledge of the centrality of indigenous knowledge production to African liberation? And what are those obstacles? In recreating that specific history, one of the bigger things that we'll be focusing on would be then to eliminate the idea of research-based economies and carry on with what we refer to as knowledge-based economies. Our economies are richly based on, on the idea of research, the statistics, as numbers as I give them to you. And quite often there was a saying, and if I'm not wrong, that these statistics will shift and they continuously will around the world. But how do we then, does government, utilities, private sector, and we're using Sankara's ideals manage the massive build-out capacity needed to meet the demand of the new Africa? Do we already have that in play? If we don't, then we are simply sending our people to a different direction. I will give you one 
capering episode of the current decline of the American empire, where Sundar Pika is hearing in front of Congress. Perhaps because the Google CEO is a soft-spoken figure, his energy seemed particularly at odds with the hilarious Atlas bombast of the elected representatives. But in one particular enjoyable sequence, California representative Zoe Longframe tried to wrap her head around how Google generated the results for image search. Why, she wondered? Did Donald Trump appear when she typed the word idiot into the search bar? Now, Sunda tried his best to explain, but Logfriend wasn't certainly convinced. Just to make sure she understood, she asked the CEO to confirm that it wasn't just some little man sitting behind a curtain figuring out what we are going to show the user, right? Right, Pikai asserted, bashful smile just about curbed. Dozens of other gleeful, bundling interludes could be picked, likely from countries around the world. Politicians have proven to be especially almost virtuously inept at grasping the basics of technology. Now, from Sankara to today, in that respect, Africa's regulators are no different. The action they tend to take when faced with incomprehension, however, absolutely is, if America's strategy has been to do nothing, declare, declare catastrophe as a card, then continue to do nothing. African governments usually burn first and ask questions later. Neither approach is perfect, though the former does have the benefit of empowering innovation, even as it has permitted social media giants to kerjack our cognitive functions. A slightly different analogy by the Reverend T.D. Jakes when he mentioned that our minds are the last frontier of privacy. One must be able to birth the idea in the womb of their mind before they can speak it through the canal of their mouth. I feel that Sankara's words were lost to so many corridors, and that might be something we need to resuscitate. Thank you, Dr. Etumile. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I would like to get this conversation deeper by requesting um, Professor Msueli, Executive Dean, Graduate School of Business Leadership at UNISA, uh, to please come forward onto the podium and um, do some uh, response to the paper as we uh, engage further on what the ambassador has raised. Thank you. Your Excellency, Ambassador Tal um, Edgars, what a beautiful, insightful presentation you've just given us. And um, I must give it to you that you are an amazing storyteller. I was just taken aback listening to how you um, have articulated the history of Africanism and how you have connected uh, uh, this history with facts and figures in terms of how great Africa's potential is. So my uh, response to your discussion, I would basically cluster it into three themes. Firstly, I just want to uh, refer back to some of the key highlights that you brought in into this presentation. You started off with a beautiful Senegalese story of uh, a man who basically consumes from the time he opens his eyes uh, to the time he goes to bed and feeds his family and as he leads his life, how he consumes all products and services outside of Senegal. And that really rings a bell for us Africans when we talk about the subject that you've covered today. And uh, you really uh, emphasized on the whole issue of made in Africa, which remind me of what Paul Kagame has always said um, as he ushered in with other African leaders, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. He mentioned that Africa must produce what it consumes. And you then touched on um, treating Africa as one country. But before I go any further, in terms of consumption, we might not be developed, but 
we boast of reserves of gold, copper, aluminium, platinum, oil, crude oil, petroleum and natural gas, uh, coffee, iron ore, cotton, to name but, but a few. So indeed, we might not be as developed as you have said. And you just mentioned something really to take home and you said, as much as we're not developed, but in terms of culture, we are miles and lights ahead of other countries uh, that are sort of viewed in the world as the most developed countries. I would have loved you to talk a little bit about the fact that we have the cradle of humankind and uh, scientists have actually mentioned that uh, life began in Africa. And I would have loved to hear more about that when you were talking about um, the development of Africa and the fact that we might not be as developed as other countries. You then took us through a beautiful journey where you were describing uh, the history of Africanism and you juxtapose the different histories of uh, big uh, empires such as the Chinese, uh, the Americas, and the Europe's uh, of this world. I particularly liked what you said when you say that we seem to have been uh, caught up in particular cliches. And I'm going to be concluding by saying exactly what you said. We've been caught up in the cliches and you again juxtapose the theories that some of these leaders brought forth, uh, such as Ngwame Nkrumah, Nyerere, uh, the Senegalese um, Leopold, um, uh, you said, seek ye first the political kingdom and all other things uh, will add up. And you, you actually have shown that those other things do not add up. And in, in talking about these different um, Pan-Africanists, uh, you emphasize their real highlights and uh, their ideological inclination. For example, you said Kwame Nkrumah um, was of the view that we should uh, harness African resources. And that was slightly different, maybe um, fundamentally, fundamentally different to um, uh, Sir Leopold, who said we must not be placed out of the globalization, but rather see positive aspects of colonialism. Uh, which is what Ngume uh, did not believe in. You then touched on something quite interesting that we sometimes forget, the fact that um, we have started uh, international trade and globalization a very long time ago. In fact, we were the products ourselves of globalization during the trade, uh, slave trade. And you mentioned uh, some statistics that I want to highlight, perhaps um, uh, that uh, the writings of Eltis and Jennings in 1780 captured. They said that as early as in the 1680s, the current value of African exports of slaves and commodities to the Atlantic world totaled over 6.6 .6 million uh, pounds. And to actually paint that beautiful history, taking us right up to the Berlin Conference, where the scramble of Africa began, and coming up with um, that ancient history where you were citing Edward um, Blyden and his philosophy, uh, a, a real son of the soil, uh, born, in, in, uh, born from Senegal. And you highlighted again his contribution to Africanism, and you then touched on the establishment of the um, organization of African unity that was the triumph for uh, Nyerere's ideology in, the in 1963. You painted that beautiful history and talked about um, the Abuja Treaty of 1991, just painting again that political, uh, ideological, and um, African, regional African integration um, history and ideologies, which really um, was a beautiful context to then what you came up to do to paint now the economic potential and what you title as the tidal wave of opportunities for Africa. You gave us these statistics that really open our eyes in terms of the opportunities that we have in Africa. Um, and you, you um, reinforce that with the idea that 1.2, uh, we have over 1.2 billion linguistic 
uh, uh, sorry, you started with pointing out the number of uh, people that are likely to be in Africa in 2025, which is to double the amount of population right now from 1.2 billion to 2.4 billion. And as you said in your opening remarks, what we have is linguistic multiplicity in Africa. And how do we harvest that linguistic multiplicity? I would really love to hear that because that has potential uh, to be monetized in terms of um, looking at platforms or uh, uh, technology uh, to ensure that uh, people are able to communicate still retaining their language multiplicities. You also indicated that in the future we are likely to see uh, Africa uh, burgeoning in terms of the middle class and uh, you mentioned that the top five countries uh, that are likely to house uh, the, the majority of Africans is Congo, Tanzania, Nigeria, Egypt, and Ethiopia. I would like to add that the sixth country would be uh, uh, possibly South Africa to add to, your, to the five countries that uh, you have mentioned. What is interesting in the statistics you've pointed out is that of the 2.4 billion people that are expected uh, to be in Africa, 50% of those will be the young people. The question in fact, what you've pointed out is that we are likely to have the largest pool of the labor demands uh, in Africa. Now, the question then becomes, what does that hold? What opportunities do that hold for our university, which is the largest uh, university in Africa? It appears to me that that would be a very interesting topic for us now to engage after you've uh, delivered this brilliant speech to say what are the implications in terms of what programs should we offer? How do we prepare the youth uh, to participate? Because as much as we have more than 50% of Africans being the youth, we also have the highest statistics in terms of youth unemployment. So it appears to me that the, we have an opportunity to come up with programs that um, move us away from this displacement of youth in the in the employment uh, value chain you mentioned that africa would become the next manufacturing hub and again that has serious implications and i'm thinking as an educator that has serious implications in terms of what are we going to teach our youth how, what are we going to teach our students to prepare them for these uh, tidal wave of opportunities that you have identified you then said we have said much in Africa, and indeed, you're correct because we have had big conversations. We have started a long time ago, with, as you pointed out, that culminated in the 2063 agenda that was established in um, 19 in the Abuja Treaty. But the conversation started in 1963. We then had around 1980 and 1990 a second phase with regional organisations. Uh, looking at promoting economic um, integration to solve regional problems. We have seen in 1990 the third most ambitious uh, phase that you touched on, that was um, uh, the Abuja Treaty of 1991. And in 2000, 34 years later, almost 2000 to 2011, 34 years later, we then saw uh, the establishment of the three most successful regional economic uh, communities that have given birth to the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. So this history, you are you eloquently painted it, and you you gave us uh, scenarios and possibilities for reimagining Africa again. And I just want to say that. Uh, uh, you, you, a colleague asked about your views on Thomas Sankara, and I just couldn't believe it because Thomas Sankara is one of my favorite African leaders. And what I loved about him is just two things. The first one is that he said, do not ever trust a leader that cannot uh, uh, perform art, any form of art. And, and Thomas Sankara himself was a guitarist. And he also said something very interesting. It's one of my favorite quotes by Thomas Sankara. He said, you cannot carry out fundamental change without a certain amount of madness. 
in this case, it comes from non-conformity, the courage to turn your back on the old formulas, which is precisely what you said, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Edgar. You said exactly what Thomas Sankara said. He said, the courage to turn your back on the old formulas, in your words, the old cliches, the courage to invent the future, which is precisely what you said, His Excellency. And he said, it took the madmen of yesterday for us to be able to act with extreme clarity today. I want to be one of those madmen. We must dare to invent the future. And I would like, in concluding this piece as a discussant, I leave the words, uh, I leave the last word to a Nobel Prize, uh, Peace Prize winner. Her Excellency Salif, who elegantly and smoothly expresses my position about uh, this eloquent lecture you've given us. And she said, if your dreams do not scare you, they are not big enough. And indeed, this afternoon, uh, His Excellency, you have reminded us of the big dream of Africa. I thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Musweli. Please do not switch off your camera. And I'll ask uh, Professor Linkabula if she's here, if she could join us. And um, the ambassador also to, to please switch on your cameras and we could have a refreshing conversation. And of course, thank you for, for highlighting the key most important, of course, uh, elements of, of the paper. Um, there's a, there's a question here from uh, Humphrey Mohasha who says, why is Africa unable to highly industrialize and produce for its own people? Is it because universities curricula is irrelevant? Then you have another one from Guto Busani. We have since moved closer to unity or further since 1960s. Or have we since moved uh, to uh, closer to unity or further since the 1960s? Then the last one um, is from uh, Kedebe, who says, what will be the solution? What will be the solution? How Africa will be, will move forward? And what about the brain drain? And how possible is it to keep that? Uh, over to you, discussants. I, I will give the stage to, to, to the dear professor, ladies first, before I can make comments on it. I'm going to comment on why is Africa unable to highly industrialize and produce for its for its people? Is it because the university's curricula is irrelevant? Well, that question really requires us to have very difficult conversations uh, with ourselves uh, because um, the university education trajectory has moved from colonial education to um, Bantu education. And after Bantu education, we have we had outcome-based education. We, have the, we had the white papers. Uh, on higher education. And in fact, if you really look back, um, uh, to borrow from um, His Excellency, where history becomes very important, if you look back, in my view, there are many, well, not many, there, there are fundamental mistakes I believe we have made. Uh, the very first mistake is to disaggregate or disintegrate the education system. Right now, you have, for example, um, uh, uh, foundation education being offered by a different department called social development. Then you have basic education being offered by a different education uh, department. Then you have higher education. In the past, when the education system was not as, um, uh, I, th I think, as massified as we have it now, we had one education department, and that allowed a proper articulation <laughs> from, that allowed a, a clear articulation so that by the time you've had a student reach university, they have been adequately uh, prepared. And 
The reason, therefore, in my view, that we are not able to industrialize is because we have not really identified as a country the areas where we want to differentiate ourselves and then articulate that in the manner in which we manage um, our education system and uh, the outputs we want out of our education system. So in put differently, our industrialization policy, if you actually look at our industrialization policy, it does not tie in with what we are doing in our education system. These are poles apart. So for as long as there is that disintegration between the industrial policy of South Africa and the education system of South Africa, we are not yet ready to, uh, to catapult South Africa to the next level. And I want to answer that again by giving you an illustration. If you look at the industrial policy of Germany, for example, you will find that there is a clear articulation between that industrial policy and what is taught at kindergarten, primary school, high school and university. If you look at the industrial policy of India, India was able uh, to also catapult itself and come up as one of the highly industrialized country. And in fact, they came up as tops in terms of um, technology, the STEM um, uh, 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 systems of education. China, likewise. So I just think that this is something, as uh, His Excellency has indicated, we have the capacity. It's just a question of administration and thinking through how we integrate these aspects to make sure that all our efforts are moving towards taking South Africa forward. I thank you. Perhaps, uh, Professor Puleng, you'd like to go first, because I was going to throw my hat in on the educational part of this argument. Um, but I feel it necessary that I should, first of all, bow to superior knowledge. So I'd, I'd give Professor Puleng the response to go first before I do. I was going to defer and refer to you, uh, Ambassador. However, I just want to state that uh, perhaps um, Perhaps Professor Msoli has a point in saying how do we entwine our educational systems with the industrialization systems. But it must be, uh, uh, it must be, we, we must have a critical analysis of um, our educational systems having uh, to a large extent uh, uh, operated as consumer knowledge systems. And therefore, the radical assertion that our knowledge systems, our civilizations, and language systems must be entwined with policy systems around the aspirations of society here in South Africa and in the continent is quite an important point. The, the, the next matter that I think is quite uh, uh, requires our attention is the fact that uh, whereas the liberation uh, movement and impulses of the of 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 the liberation uh, movement were about freedom, about liberty, and around uh, the affirmation of the dignity of the humanity of Africans, having learned uh, two hundred years before that such uh, processes are quite violent uh, through the histories of, for instance, of Haiti. We, 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 we therefore, for this generation and future generations, must look at how this liberation impulses and emancipatory knowledge systems and history are also entwined with economics, precisely because they fought for voice, for freedom, for our for our abilities to determine what is it and the future that we want, whether expressed through the, the, the whole notions of the African Union or the organization of the African Union prior to that, or even in the movements of societies which were not entwined with the political uh, uh, um, systems and political structures. These are quite important areas. 
the, the final point that I, I find quite exciting in the proposition that Ambassador Edgars made is the idea on how we harness the youthful dividend that Africa's uh, um, societies have and how do we ensure that we catapult and harness this in order that uh, there is active participation not only in the countries uh, within the, con uh, the continent but also in the global arena understanding the hegemony or hegemonic contest contestations that are available and ensuring that we are not uh, consumers of these uh, socio-political and socio-economic systems and strategies. So I'm of the view that there, there are multi-pronged strategies, including for universities to ensuring that we are proud of ourselves, that Africa's civilizations, inventions are not just spoken about, but translate into inventive uh, 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 solutions for societal transformation, for economic uh, justice and ecological fr flourishing. Whilst at the same time, because we live and have lived in contexts where our dignity has been marginalized, trampled upon through conquest, colonialization, neo-colonialism, and we still, even today, have to assert our humanity that we do so by rallying the latent but also the complex experiences of the continent to changing it for the better and ensuring that higher education is not just for the elites but it transforms it engages it dialogues and it's at the center of innovative transformation societies require thank you Thank you so much, Professor Puleng. I, I was hoping I'd have one word in, but clearly both yourself and Professor um, Sueli have been able to, to feed off the energy of that question. But I will, I will, I will attempt, if anything, Dr. Tumeleng, if you're patient with me, allow me some latitude. Um, some questions that gather from what um, Humphrey has asked was first, um, why is Africa unable to highly industrialize? I don't think that's a question that perhaps if I could rephrase it on he, his behalf is, Let's go the education way. Uh, we are creating exports for the Western market. Just in one year, we are seeing raw talent and, and Africa is generating more raw talent than it should. But that is the truth. In 2020, we are projected to have a workforce of 504 million, 122 million more than in 2010. Out of that, by 2034, Africa will have more working age citizens, aged 15 to 64. If we are to industrialize, what happens to that age age group that we are talking about, 45 plus. And so there's this new coined terminology that there's a next generation. I believe there's a new generation, not next generation, a new generation encompassing of a huge linguistic multiplicity of people who have got new and fresh ideas. And innovative ideas do not have an age cap to it. So it wouldn't be then next generation, it would be new generation. But then the second part would be how then do we monetize knowledge? Because what we are doing is we are creating workers for the Western world. In just a year of um, coronavirus, our supply chain was disrupted, and that particularly happened because we are not manufacturers. We are buyers. If you look at the trends, they're talking about our consumer spending, not our production, right? So we will have enough trajectory of discretionary income, but what are we doing in our own soil? We have got the largest landmass. Nobody's talking about where the world is going for forward in terms of agribusiness in Africa. If I asked in a closed room how many companies in Africa make 1 billion US dollars, nobody ever knows. There are 400 million companies in Africa that have got an annual income of 1 billion US dollars, but they're all trading in Africa. Why don't we see the opportunity as one that we can scale down um, within Africa itself? We do not have particularly an, a sandbox policy, and by that, Africa is the only place where we cannot protect ideas. So if we are talking about students, we're talking about you know, education. How do we then protect our ideas? How do we create this, this, this thinking where we can be able to protect and grow these ideas towards industrialization? How do we reskill the skilled? So we are moving faster, and that is why I asked, what's the difference between transformation and change? So change is what happens to a frog. It's a tadpole. 
ideally it's a frog at birth it's just a tadpole it's going to change into a frog the ideal state of what has happened is nothing different transformation is where we take a caterpillar into a butterfly and so maybe we are having butterfly ideas in a frog market maybe perhaps that will be the ideology but the truth be told that if we are indeed to move forward in terms of industrialization then we must fix this little things we must be able to fix education we must be able to fix regulators we cannot ban and ask questions later um, our academic institutions have been able to create think tanks over and over again but we have invited the collaboration of western um, academies and we have said they have had a much better chance that is why our students our children look forward to ivy league schools there was a time Fort Harry was one of the best that we could speak about. In fact, if we met from anywhere and you said you had by then come from Africa, Fort Harry, or you had come from um, Nairobi University, or you had come from University of South Africa, you are heralded a leader during the Berlin Conference. Today, we are so pervaded from it if we do not produce an MIT or a Harvard certification. And truth be told, maybe we are creating the tallest academic dwarfs. We cannot solve our own solutions if we are to seek other people to solve them for us. So mine is not, why can we not industrialize? Is when do we industrialize? And how do we do it? How does it fix itself with the idea that we have also had an adult's literacy that is beginning to pick up? How do we fix our township economies? And by township economies, then it relates me to every other village area that we look at. There's a decentralization of spending and the de devolution of government services into and that is an entirely different conversation for me to have before i create more enemies than friends but indeed those are the things that we need to solve if we're to talk about that if we're to talk about african religion and what place it plays today that we have far off left everything else and we have adopted in fact today i do sincerely apologize i had two conversations in the morning where i asked how should i dress for this lecture because i was about to show up in in my african fitting regalia because we are speaking about africa and so i must hold myself to that same standing but then this victorian ways do not go away easily do they so we are to fix industrialization but we are not to do it at the expense of our linguistic multiplicity, our diversity, our culture, define the state in which we are in now and say to ourselves that yes, we have a growing population, but this growing population needs to be reskilled rather than automated. We cannot automate people and yet they are still in the gig working areas. Half the mining areas in South Africa are created by people who have got only metric. They're working in the mines. Is it okay for us to automate this? Or do we automate enough for them to understand why they need to work there? This has gone on and on and on. And it will bring me again to now the ideas around contemporary African feminism. So I'd, I'd hold myself before I become too passionate about the topic. Dr. Tumeleng, if you will, please. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, uh, uh, we're left with a couple of minutes uh, from what I, I gather. Um, I would like to, to, to raise further questions that have been raised. Um, and perhaps as I'm, I'm reading these questions, uh, if Ambassador, you could perhaps maybe be uh, thinking about this, this question around, you know, Western and Chinese uh, gaze over Africa. Right. Uh, right. As, as, yes. Um, right. There's a question from uh, uh, Bati, I think it's Bati Gold. Um, and he says, he or she says, why is UNISA concerned and in investing in the 4IR concept as opposed to focusing on its relative needs such as access to internet, infrastructure for internet, public Wi-Fi, et cetera? Then there's another question from Gabriel Peha, who says this, how do we industrialize Africa? And how do we achieve that without capitalism dictating to us on how? Then he raises another question is, what measures are we to, to use or to implement to bridge the global bridge or the, uh, the global inequality uh, for Africa to compete globally fairly? And uh, I think I will I will raise only on those questions and perhaps maybe the discussions, if you could um, engage us on those questions, please. Thank you. Dr. 
Dr. Tumeling, I'll take I'll take direction from you on which question you. Yes, uh, uh, yes. Um, uh, perhaps maybe if you could if you could address the question around um, uh, uh, Africa and um, industrialization. I think there's a, how do we industrialize right there's a dignity we must pay to in regards to where Africa has come from and perhaps we may not be where we need to be but definitely we're not where we used to be and and to that much then latitude is given to us the the issue around Western and Asian markets and their influence across Africa has been purely based on the ideas that there's an African saying that do not lose focus of the gazelle for the squirrel and many a times we do we, we would like the infrastructure, we would like the, the, to, you know, the money that comes from the Western world. But we're not paying attention to how the powerhouses, and if I were to show you correctly in, in terms of South Africa and how we come from, in the last 10 years, we were supposed to have added 10,000 people into the middle class. Instead, post-COVID, we have removed 25,000 people from the middle class. Now, according to that trajectory alone, that means that in the next five years, South Africa will have lost at least 23 people out of the middle class into another city, and if not anything else, perhaps Mauritius. Why? Because we have learned to take our checkbook diplomacy, which is what China has been good at, and it has done that to the world over. It is not doing that alone in Africa, it is doing that in India. And Professor Mzweli was quite right when she spoke about India, and if somebody was to go back into how British really impoverished India and their textile industry, then there would not be much for us to focus on rather than ask ourselves, is industrialization the issue or is the real issue at hand the learning of lessons? Because it clearly seems that we have not learned. And in the word of Tom Ferrer, who carefully said that perhaps COVID was a jolly good thing, with a capital J, a capital G, and a capital T. Why is that? Because it was a reset button around the world to look at our supply chains and question where exactly have we gone wrong? What can we do to augment that kind of vacuum? And what are the decisions that we need to make? In that same line of thinking, Africa has got very young constitutions. It was testing the flexibility of the constitutions. And, and, and clearly, if you look at the last five years, you would see that even during elections in places like Kenya, in places like Sierra Leone, in places like Ghana, presidents have now been brought to contend as to whether or not constitutionally the acts that were done were correct. So we are not yet at a point where we should match our industrialization to Britain or match our industrialization to China. But we are asking from the diagnosis of where we come from and looking at the world of Pan-Africanism, black nationalism, or alternatively, to look at what was the, ins the, the whole idea around self-determination, what have we done right? And I would say we are well on our way. We might not be there, but we are well on our way. We are answering ourselves about the issues around gender. We are asking these questions today. Does the constitution uphold the very essence as to what the liberation movement for African contemporary feminism was? We're asking about African religion. Does the constitution keep in mind the ideals of African religion? Does it even put the ideals of African religion into play? We are asking about the fact that our education system needs to change, but we are not saying that it entirely needs to be done away with. But we must respect that there was something right with our traditional system of education and it needed to add on and augment itself with where the world was going to. We are competing with the West to the point we have become the West. We, don't need, no, we no longer need to talk about where the West is going to. If you could pay attention to the fact that, and, and this has been quite surmising for some of the teams of people I work with, it takes you four hours to travel between here and Kenya and it takes you three hours to travel between Kenya and Ghana, but it takes you four hours to travel from the United States to Ghana. Our infrastructure in itself has created a catastrophe for us to be able to leverage on the institutional thinking that we have so far had. If you were to drive a bike between Cairo, between Cape Town and Cairo, it would take you six months. Quite less than you coming from probably Nevada going all the way to Minnesota. 
if we cannot fix those gaps, those institutional gaps, the infrastructure gaps, those vacuums in society, industrialization might, might just as well be a pipe dream. And that is where I hold my objective view. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, may I ask, because of the time constraints, that the, the other discussant, if you could just, in, 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 in a minute, in a minute, just uh, address one aspect of the... Thank you. If I may, I will address the one that asks why is UNISA concerned in investing in the 4IR concept as opposed to focusing on its relative needs? Um, my considered view um, uh, to articulate it in one minute is that that question is correct. We should put a whole lot of energy in influencing policy uh, for access to um, to internet infrastructure, because um, for IR for most of, of our people will not mean much. However, um, we we have no choice. We we cannot say we can't invest on for IR at the same time because it is we are in a complex space and our responsibility now, in fact, the most important competence now is the ability to be resilient and sit in an uncomfortable space, which is the space we are in. We are in an uncomfortable paradox or dichotomy where on one hand, we have a whole lot of South Africans who cannot access infrastructure, even if they have technology. At the same time, we have um, and this is basically because of the duality of our economy. We are in that space and we need to be able to navigate that space. And perhaps we are the ones who are going to teach the world how to navigate complex spaces. So it's not a question of investing or not investing on 4IR. We have to invest on 4IR. We also have to put a bigger energy because we know where we come from as Africans. We've got to put much more energy around influencing policy uh, to make technology more accessible for our people. Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, may I request um, Professor uh, Masinya Mwanampashele, um, uh, Acting Executive Director in the Office of the Principal and Vice Chancellor, to please give us a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Principal and Vice Chancellor, Professor Pulinlinka Bula, Ambassador Professor uh, Edgar, members of uh, the UNISA Council who might be watching, and all protocol observed in the interest of time. I would like to take this opportunity to first thank uh, Professor Moza Madigana and her team in the department for organizing such a wonderful uh, event in which we were really well fed. Thank you also for ably introducing our guest. And I would like to thank Professor Meiwa for reminding us so ably about the purpose of why we gathered this afternoon. Thank you to the VC for actually uh, in that history, having come up with this wonderful idea of the Africa lecture in which African intellectuals engage so ably and remind us about the prospects 
uh, about the, the, the challenges, about the victories, about what lies ahead of us as scholars on the African continent. I would like to thank you also for reminding us about the importance of our uh, offerings that are relevant, that needs to transform uh, our African context, particularly for the political and economic empowerment in this context. Uh, to our guest lecturer, Ambassador Prof. Edgar, you have given us a mouthful. Your initial narrative about the Senegalese that reminded us about how we consume what we have not, you know, is not ours, but also towards the end, reminding us that we need to do something about little things. We need to do something ourselves. Reminded me that despite the negative portraits that Africa is, is usually portrayed with, this, despite the pessimism, we have hope and particularly with the youthful population that we have, we need to do something, particularly in the context of education and ultimately, as uh, Prof. Musueli reminded us, not only educating them, but also educating them for graduateness in order for them to be employable. So therefore, Prof. Uh, uh, Ambassador, Thank you so very much. It was really eye-opening. You can see the kind of questions that emerged, the kind of engagement. And to your lecture, Prof. Musueli did a good job by giving a, a brief but rich response to what you have presented to us this afternoon. Thank you so much, Prof. Musueli. And to Dr. Itumele Motuai, you ran uh, the, the the program so well and enabled us to follow through until the end. To the people who may not be seen, you know, the people who are behind the, the, the technology, Matthew and your group, thank you so much for enabling us to link, you know, with people from all over the country and all over the world. And we want to appreciate the fact that you enabled us to present what we would have loved to present ably and to the team of Ndadima Morovela, Ms. Ms. Mpatele, and all your team for organizing from behind closed doors. Ms. Gugu, we want to say thank you so much. You did a good job. And I hope those I may not have mentioned, but who have done a good job, will pardon me, know that all your contributions are noted and they have contributed to making this event a great success that it has been. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Masinya for the vote of thanks ladies and gentlemen to the end we will have uh, conversations uh, a further invite uh, thank you